Okay, we are live. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, this is session 11A, Migration as Adaptation. My name is Anna Lopresti, and as a conference organizer, I'm excited to be chairing this session and to listen to a really great set of panelists today. We have six presentations, which will touch on a range of topics, including community-led planning, equitable relocation, and cascading impacts with examples from the US and internationally, as well as rural and urban experiences. Um, please feel free to use the Q&A uh, section to drop in any questions you have during the presentations, and we will do our best to address them after all of the presentations have finished. So I would like to welcome our first presenter, Anna Maria Bukvich, who will be speaking on flood-induced tipping points and cascading events of relocation in coastal, rural, and urban areas. Thank you all uh, for being here. I hope you can hear me well. Um, I will be again talking about tipping points and cascading events, and I will not talk much about uh, coastal hazards and climate ch uh, change impacts that coastal zone is experiencing, because I'm sure that we are all aware here about what's going on in that general area. And I will immediately move to a discussion on relocation decision-making. 
As most of you are aware, a decision to move and participate in buyouts, it's a very complex one uh, that depends on many different considerations on household and personal level. For example, it depends on risk perceptions and place attachments that we know can change over time, on financial resources uh, for recovery, for moving, and also uh, for adaptation in situ. It depends on values and coping capacity a family may have and then experience with flooding. And if it was traumatic, more likely that person may say yes. Depends on the impacts on livelihoods and confidence in government, whether the government uh, is responding and doing something about problem of flooding or not, or is planning to do so in the future. And also aspirations and future plans, uh, because most people do have some aspirations to maybe move somewhere else once when they retire. And again, uh, it is not directly related with flooding, but certainly influences what people may decide to do. And all of these and many other factors out there, they are deeply personal, really uh, cumulatively can uh, lead to decision uh, to move. And moreover, to kind of the threshold when somebody will say, yes, OK, I'm now committing and will explore this option. Uh, that leads me to cascading events. So this study uh, really... Um, or the main objective of the study was to identify flood-induced cascading events in coastal, rural, and urban jurisdictions that may result in uh, tipping points and eventual out-migration of residents and businesses. And the considerations I mentioned on the previous uh, page basically are all that basically feed into that decision and lead to tipping points in kind of more aggregate manner. Uh, so we are also trying to identify what are those early signs of potential tipping points or maybe cascades that we can influence through policy and planning adjustments that could um, influence the eventual outcome or out migration. So cascading event effects, uh, FEMA describes them as uh, based basically events that occur as a direct or indirect result of an, any initial event. And that event can be something after major disaster like Hurricane Sandy here on the pictures on the bottom, when we are dealing with uh, uh, extensive uh, damage to the community and neighborhoods, businesses moving out, uh, vacant homes and so forth. Or it can be a sequence on smaller recurrent flood events that will uh, uh, augment uh, the impacts and then again lead to those various cascades across many different systems. For example, businesses, school system, uh, health and medical system and so forth. And they can again interact within that um, in each kind of uh, element. As of tipping points, uh, Francois Gemene said that or defined them as points where a small change can trigger much larger nonlinear and offer irreversible change. People often refer to tipping points or thresholds as a point of no return when everything goes well until a community or a person or households hit that tipping point and then everything goes down the hill. Uh, social tipping points can be defined somewhat differently, but basically they uh, generally signify a community that uh, moves away from a state of stability to instability, or in qualitative terms, basically moves to a new state, uh, usually more adverse um, and less favorable. And tipping points and thresholds are overall in social system very difficult to measure, especially to quantify and assign some numeric values to them. Uh, so in that sense, our approach which uh, might be a really good fit for this. Um, we also focused our study in uh, case study uh, in area of mid-Atlantic of the United States in rural and urban coastal shoreline counties, according to NOAA classification in Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina. And this area is of uh, great interest just because of their high relative sea level rise, uh, mostly due to land subsidence. So this area is experiencing land subsidence because of a number of different factors, namely glacial isostatic rebound and significant aquifer depletion. And again, in rural areas, that's happening because extraction due to uh, for irrigation and in urban areas, um, 
It's a relief to support uh, industry and also public use. And then also there is land compaction. So in addition to uh, land subsidence, uh, a lot of these uh, areas are very of very low elevation with many different waterways. And hydrological system in uh, watersheds in uh, these three coastal areas is a very uh, complex as well. On top of that, all these different areas have very outdated and poorly maintained stormwater infrastructure. In the rural areas, usually it's just canal and ditches, they're not dredged properly. And now with high tides and more rain, basically they overflow every single time. And in urban environments, it's just an outdated infrastructure that was not updated. And why this area is also of great interest to really understand what's going on and what might transpire in the future because of coastal hazards is just because there's a lot of important stuff there, a lot at risk. So in uh, rural areas, we have number of poultry and hog farms and agriculture and growing um, uh, basically seafood and aquaculture industry. And in urban areas, we have number of important cultural, historic, and geopolitical assets, and also in Hampton Roads, military assets and federal facilities, which are, of course, of significant uh, importance for national security. So in our approach, we recruited uh, decision makers working on coastal resilience in case study locations. And again, just to mention that recruitment happened in the April of last year and was very difficult. It was at the uh, beginning of the COVID pandemic. And a lot of people experience uh, dramatic uh, work-life balance changes and personal professional hardship. And overall, on top of that, this was a very challenging topic. So uh, it took us a while to recruit, but eventually we ended up with 30 respondents who are all committed and knowledgeable with coastal resilience in these areas. We conducted interviews via Zoom uh, because of RB uh, restrictions, had to kind of innovate and quickly transition from in-person to Zoom. Uh, uh, in the summer of 2020, each interview lasted around 60 minutes and had uh, were uh, guided with five lead questions uh, that were grounded in the literature and tipping points and cascades. Uh, responses uh, were audio recorded, transcribed, and then analyzed in qualitative data analysis software and Vivo using hybrid coding strategy and inductive and deductive approaches. So as of finding, I'm sorry, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. There's um, the icons of the other speakers are up on your screen. If you could minimize that, um, it's blocking some of the text. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. No problem. Go Is ahead. that better? Yeah. Hmm. Thanks. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you for um, alerting me about this. So as a cascading event, again, this is just a synthesis of some of the findings we have, but on a question, what are some of the cascading events in both rural and urban environments? Respondents said that primarily uh, events that could induce cascading uh, cascades would be nuisance or recurrent flooding, followed by storms and hurricanes, and then sea level rise uh, that could exacerbate the flooding. Um, Mostly in both areas, they talked about storms and gave more weight to uh, nor'easters and minor tropical storms, their big events, hurricanes. When they talked about hurricanes, it was mostly about prior, uh, prior events that happened like Hurricane Katrina and Sandy. And what would that mean for this region if something like that happened, but not as of if something would directly happen. They also mentioned a lot of issues and concerns with rainfall becoming a more growing problem and also wind driven flooding and damages. In rural areas, as uh, cascading events, uh, respondents primarily mentioned uh, impacts related to primary economic sector, uh, impacts on farming, fishing, seafood industry, and tourism. And most of them actually mentioned COVID uh, pandemic uh, that already affected tourism and also aquaculture because restaurants were closed and supply demand uh, chains were interrupted. So basically they're saying that may serve as a demo what can happen and how they are dependent on tourism uh, and um, that can become a challenge with more frequent flooding. They also said, you know, because of that, it was evident if there are no jobs, then uh, there are no taxes and then no taxes, school system and public services like emergency response and others can deteriorate. And most, almost all respondents were talking about broadband uh, as being significant uh, factor that can influence how these cascades will unfold and uh, being kind of factor that can um, lead to better uh, uh 
uh, adaptation um, and more strong uh, st and uh, resilience. In urban areas, the respondents talked about uh, pre-existing socioeconomic disparities between neighborhoods and ongoing social problems, meaning that uh, different neighborhoods uh, uh, would respond differently based on uh, what they're already experiencing related to other urban issues. They also uh, noted in urban environments, there are different level in interconnectedness and dependencies which are more complex with some households or families living in one municipality working in another and they're having kids in school in the third municipality. And they also mentioned significant concerns with quality of life and developmental pressures, meaning that uh, many developers in urban environments, it seems, are already aware and shifting slowly investment from high-risk areas further inland or uphill or in places like Richmond, uh, Charlotte, or Durham. Uh, but unfortunately, also in many places that are environmentally uh, sensitive. As of tipping points, uh, in rural respondents and urban agree that it would be probably major uh, hurricane, uh, either consecutive hurricanes or major or direct hit, uh, followed by sea level rise uh, that would uh, lead to long-term sustained flooding, or as in urban areas, they call it constantly nuisance flooding, and that could lead also to out-migration. They also agreed that another tipping point for many uh, coastal communities in our case study locations would be give uh, FEMA and government and state support would uh, hold back funding uh, for uh, flood insurance and then also road, roads and utilities. In rural areas, they talked about loss of tourism and resource-based industry, but also uh, many respondents mentioned that rural areas also are areas of high poverty, low opportunity and low income, meaning that uh, basically uh, they have different uh, baseline than urban areas and are already significantly disadvantaged when it comes what are their options. And many areas eventually uh, will become too inhospitable to stay with some communities that will simply perish, either because there is no political will for from the country county governments to uh, do and invest in adaptation in some remote villages or uh, because it's not cost effective. In urban areas, respondents said basically what would really represent a tipping point related to flooding is if major employers would leave, like federal partners, especially military, health industry, and many other institutions that employs a lot of people. So if they would leave, work workforce would leave as well. They also talked about loss of military and its culture, meaning that a lot of people uh, do come in the area to have benefit from those military services. Um, and uh, just being in a community uh, of military families is important to many. And then also lifeline infrastructure and assets in urban area and settings are important. And then, as I mentioned before, declining quality of life, uh, especially secondary flood impacts. As one urban respondent said, and if your city is asleep at the wheel on this and isn't willing to invest real dollars in the problem, then I'm going to be less inclined to stay. So from the interviews, it seems that in urban areas, uh, residents do expect a little bit more than maybe in rural areas uh, where residents are mostly self-sufficient and independent. And um, basically what we did, uh, this is our final summary of all these uh, different impacts. Uh, we found out that both rural and urban areas experience many shared uh, challenges. Uh, due to nuisance flooding, they mostly experience blocked roads that can then li limit uh, uh, commute or uh, commute to school back and forth or to work and also block emergency vehicles. And this is a bigger problem in rural areas when the road is usually uh, a lifeline for many remote, again, satellite villages uh, that use the road to get out of the and connect with um, other localities. Also, uh, other thing, uh, shared impacts are damaged public utilities, decreased property value and damage. There are also significant concern and psychological impacts and trauma of major events, loss of taxes that lead to loss of public service and decline, all of which they believe, uh, the respondents believe could lead to out migration. In rural areas, the biggest concern uh, these days is really with a uh, septic system, which if they were to uh, breach either because of nuisance flooding or major disaster could lead to pollution and decreased water, qual water quality. 
city and in urban areas, it's really loss of jobs and investments that could affect quality of life and increase in crime that always seems very important for urban uh, residents. Uh, so with that, uh, Thank you so much for listening in. And I'm sharing this photo of Croatia just to end up a little bit more positive note and encourage everybody to try to strike a balance between adaptation in place and that in relocation to ensure that coastal areas stay vital and exciting for a long time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anna Maria. Um, next up, we will have Sarah Kamal who will be presenting on Planning with Dignity, Indigenous Community-Led Climate Migration Planning. Sarah, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. I think you may be on mute. Thank you. Can everybody see me? Um, here we go. Okay. Still getting hang of how to do all the proper um, Stuff with Zoom. I apologize for that. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Salam, nehoma. My name is Sarah Kamal, and I am Chinese Canadian Iranian, and I'm speaking to you from uh, the Musqueam land um, where the University of British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada is based. I also do research with the Climate Migration and Research uh, Refugees Project on um, climate migration practices and policies. So, my talk today is about Indigenous climate. Um, migration adaptation. I will be diverging a little bit from my original title and abstract with apologies. Um, I will discuss the context of indigenous led uh, adaptation planning in Canada, present a case study of an ad hoc relocation of an indigenous community, then briefly highlight indigenous community specific adaptation lenses um, of possible inspiration for indigenous led uh, work here in Canada. My pur purpose is not to suggest any solutions, but just to scope out the landscape. Starting with the context, Canada is the second largest country by landmass, but the 37th largest by population. Uh, we have 38 million people. Uh, these are some of the numbers for the last eight years of internal disaster displacements captured by the uh, IDMC. In part due to our low population density, Canada's future climate displacement risk is understood to be relatively low compared to other countries. Small remote communities in the north and west are most exposed, vulnerable to coastal erosion, sea level rise, storm surges, and communities in the north also impacted by um, melting permafrost and thinning ice, warming three times faster than the global average. Urban areas um, along the coast are also affected as as are inland wildfires, um, uh, communities affected by wildfires and coastal um, river flooding. While indigenous communities comprise 5% of the population of Canada, they are currently making up about 30% of those displaced every year. Um, they've already endured forced relocation historically for non-climate related reasons, like making way for aluminum smelters, parks, cattle farms, hydro dams, urban housing, or because the government has felt that administering social programs would be more cheaply uh, done more cheaply with them located elsewhere, or has wanted them to help the government assert Canadian sovereignty over the Arctic. Restricted to living on the less desirable land of reserves, having international and provincial boundaries drawn through their home territories, and subject to assimilationist and racial segregationist policies in the Indian Act, like the past system, First Nations people's um, movement has been highly controlled historically, often blocking them from seasonal migration and other traditional practices. Then as part of the largest class action settlement in Canadian history, um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was set up. This established the commission established the that 150,000 um, Indigenous children were forcibly separated from their families and relocated to residential schools across Canada, 
and were subject to malnutrition, illness, uh, forced labor, physical and sexual abuse, and death. A recent trauma was the discovery of the remains of 215 children in an unmarked grave at a residential school in Kamloops, British Columbia. The official death toll for that school was 51. The government has now pledged $22 million to find, identify, and commemorate children in other unmarked graves. Two Catholic churches on Indigenous reserves were burned yesterday. Despite multiple displacements through centuries of colonial policies, Indigenous communities have shown extraordinary resilience in preserving their language, their traditions, and land-based ways of being. They've already experienced the dislocations that all of us now face. After this history, Indigenous communities um, continue to bear the disproportionate brunt of climate migration risk, um, despite having contributed the least to and been land and water defenders against the pollution that's changing weather patterns. The risk they face is historical and structural. Uh, in some cases, Indigenous communities' exposure to flooding has been exacerbated by water control structures that uh, diverted waters from other places, or um, Frequently, they've also been ignored in the municipal histories of dike construction just because their land has been considered less expensive. Um, coastal Indigenous communities like Tuktoyaktuk, which is an Inuvialuit community in the rapidly warming Western Canadian Arctic, is at the forefront of exposure. That community of 900 faces difficult decisions around relocation and its attendant risk of permanent cultural loss. In terms of the policy landscape, um, the Government of Canada has no climate-related migration policy, um, but it does have the following obligations. The TRC documented physical, biological, and cultural genocide of Indigenous peoples in Canada. The Government of Canada accepted that report and now is committed to um, a renewed nation-to-nation -nation relationship. And to implementing recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, and reconciling even further, including the implementation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. These emphasize Indigenous uh, self-government and creating better relations between the federal and provincial governments of Canada and Indigenous uh, nations, as well as reconciliation. China, Canada is also a champion of the Global Compact for Migration. Um, and under that, there is the report on Indigenous Peoples' rights in the context of borders, migration, and displacement which is considered uh, to be a complement that offers advice to states on upholding indigenous people's rights, experiences, um, and needs in migration policy. Um, as the GCM is a non-binding agreement, this is a political commitment more than a legal one. On the other side, uh, moving to the obligations of indigenous communities, um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission believes in the revitalization and application of indigenous law and has been calling on communities to recover and practice their own distinct legal traditions. Uh, the Indigenous Peoples of Canada are categorized into three, the Métis, the First Nations, and the Inuit. And the trouble is that often at the band and village level, uh, communities are too small to manage anything like that. There were historical nations, but those have been fragmented through disease, relocation, and government policies that um, restricted people into small settlements. The Canadian Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples in 1991 recognized this problem and said, quote, we have concluded that the right of self-government cannot reasonably be exercised by small separate communities. Whether First Nations, Inuit or Métis, it should be exercised by groups of a certain size, groups with a claim to the term nation. They will have to reconstruct themselves, unquote. So the three indigenous peoples have collective bodies that work to represent them uh, collectively in negotiations with the government of Canada. There are different layers at which they produce resolutions while working with individual communities. I'm not aware of any that pertain specifically to climate adaptation and migration, although I do know the Assembly of First Nations has been working on emergency management related resolutions at some length. In terms of the shift to self-government, uh, it's a very difficult and complicated situation. There are 53 Inuit communities, 630 First Nation communities, representing 50 nations, 50 languages, and the Métis. Um, people are governed under the Indian Act. Uh, the Métis and Inuit are not under the Indian Act. Uh, some communities are covered by historical treaties, some are not. The Inuit have a separate status with the crown. It's a really complicated space um, and with a lot of difficult transitions happening. Some communities have moved to self-government and some are in the process. Um, colleagues who are working in the field tell me that they're exhausted by the number of consultations going on. 
In other words, you kind of check a number of boxes, uh, like if you're an Indigenous woman who also is disabled, for example, your phone keeps ringing. Uh, briefly, for the case study of relocation, um, there were four communities, First Nations communities living around a lake called Lake St. Martin um, in the province of Manitoba. They, uh, one community called the Lake St. Martin First Nation chronicled what happened to them in a video uh, that I've put that, uh, in front of you over here. I recommend watching it, it's quite instructive. Um, basically, three water structures were built um, over decades, uh, starting in 1961, diverting money, uh, waters, sorry, um, from other situations which might have affected uh, farmers or cottagers and flooded their communities uh, frequently to the point that it became a yearly occurrence. Um, and this gradually, the rising waters gradually also impoverished the community. All of this was done without consultation. Um, in 2011, there was a big flood and the waters did not recede and there was an evacuation of the four communities, which then became a forced relocation. Um, the First Nations suggested a site for rebuilding, um, but instead they were housed in a more expensive abandoned military site, which was not culturally appropriate. Non-First Nations communities were compensated uh, much faster than uh, First Nations communities were. The video documents the toll of all of this on the First Nations, but also um, it's clear that afterwards the First Nations mobilized. The UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples brought the concerns of Lake St. Martin First Nations residents to the attention of the Government of Canada in 2013. A class action suit was brought against the Government of Manitoba um, by the four First Nations and won $90 in damages in 2018. Finally, in May 2021, uh, community members from the First Nations enacted a uh, two-stage return home 10 years after evacuation. 91 people from Pegui First Nation are still evacuated as of now. While this case is particularly bad, uh, it highlights a few patterns that are visible across different cases. One is an ad hoc approach to climate related disaster, which is across all jurisdictions, First Nations or not. The second is an unequal government reaction to indigenous disaster uh, versus non-indigenous disaster. Third is structural aspects to risks that uh, Indigenous communities face. A fourth is not listening to Indigenous perspectives in disaster response. And a fifth is the greater long-term cost to the government of not acting in accordance with their obligations. Now quickly, a couple of Indigenous lenses. Um, I'd like to point to this first one called Wampum. It's by Kelsey Leonard at the University of Waterloo in Canada. This, in her words, is a framework for adaptation to sea level rise informed by Northeastern and Mid-Atlantic coastal um, Indigenous knowledge systems. She herself is originally from Shinnecock Indian Reservation on Long Island, New York. She suggests Wampum as a strategies of witness, acknowledge, mend, protect, unite, and move as a decolonial alternative to other sea level rise strategies like uh, para, protect, accommodate, retreat, avoid, and AAN armoring, acquisition, and nourishment. The other framework is um, by Robin Bronin, Delise Pollock, Jacqueline Overbeck, Deanne Stevens, Susan Natalie, and Chris Mayo. It's a governance framework uh, that would enable the co production of Indigenous and Western scientific knowledges and also establish local Indigenous led environmental monitoring and assessment. This has been set up as a process for Alaska Native communities to make decisions around relocation while centering data collection and analysis in their own communities, rather than having that outsourced to external consultants. So while it's heartening to see these frameworks as useful examples and inspiration, um, I'd like to close with some thoughts on the challenges in this work in Canada. Well, one is the need for community isolation due to the pandemic. It's unclear how long that will continue. Uh, second is that trust building and relationship building takes time and the consultations have been exhausting. A third is that engagement is a struggle for some communities. Um, there's another one is that um, there's vast variation in the capacity and capital, social, economic, and political of different Indigenous communities. Uh, another is that this transition to self-government and of reconnecting and creating uh, nations is a massive uh, bit of work in itself. Um, another is that the burden adaptation is being put on individual communities. Well, now that you're self-governing, you can take care of it. Uh, while they're struggling with daily crises linked with historical impoverishment, intergenerational trauma that the rest of Canadian society doesn't understand. There's murdered and Indigenous women uh, at enormous rates. 
um, extraordinary health problems, including diabetes. There are suicide clusters of children. There's lack of infrastructure that's taken for granted. There's a level of denial in Canadian society at large, um, almost to the point of gaslighting around the ongoing injustice subsumed under the general rhetoric of Canada the good. Um, and then in terms of migration as adaptation, there needs to be so much cooperation to come across multiple jurisdictions, which is really hard enough with municipal, regional, and provincial federal groups, and we're expecting Indigenous communities in wanting to cope. All of this makes me think of the article by Kyle White, Too Late for Indigenous Climate Justice, which asks whether we are able to repair the scars of colonialism and act with accountability um, and consent with Indigenous communities, as well as take urgent environmental action in time that the tipping point of no return of ecological damage will occur before governments manage the relational tipping point of reconciliation. Uh, so the action that we will take in the future may well be on the backs of indigenous communities without their consent. I really hope we're not there, but I do think about it a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that incredibly compelling talk. Um, next up we have Marla Nelson, who will be speaking on adaptive migration, uh, bridging planning, policy, and practice for climate justice. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm Marla Nelson from the University of New Orleans, and the work that uh, I will present today is based on a research project that I conducted uh, with a number of colleagues listed here. And the project was funded by the Water Institute of the Gulf with the goal of helping implement Louisiana's comprehensive master plan for a sustainable coast. Uh, in beginning my talk for today, I want to um, make a brief land acknowledgement. Our research was conducted in Terrebonne Parish, Louisiana, uh, which is the traditional land of the peoples of the United Homa Nation the Grand Kalyu Dulac Band of the Biloxi Chittimacha Choctaw Tribe, the Ildijan Charles Band of the BCC, and the Point of Shen Tribe. Uh, all of them continue to be stewards of the land and, and contribute to uh, the vitality of the place. And uh, their tribal claims must be acknowledged and centered uh, in adaptation decisions. So the purpose of our project, it was a multi-year project uh, was to understand directly how residents of frontline communities were responding to immediate and long-term environmental changes, how households and communities were making their adaptation decisions and really understand the continuum of adaptation um, with most households trying to adapt in place uh, before uh, those that relocated ultimately doing so. We also wanted to uh, identify what were some of the most promising adaptation responses and the planning and policy barriers to relocation, and all with the goal of trying to inform more just and equitable relocation uh, policy and action. So we focused on Terrebonne Parish. Um, this is um, located, it's a county or parish in central Louisiana located along the coast. The key city, Homa, is located about 65 miles southwest of New Orleans. And a number of uh, linear communities uh, have developed from Homa along the bayous that flow uh, southward into the Gulf of Mexico. Homa derived its name from the Homa peoples who first settled uh, in the parish in the 1800s. Uh, and um, were followed by Acadians who were exiled from present day New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. And they came and uh, settled in this area. So to this day, um, this part of Louisiana remains a center of indigenous and Cajun culture. Uh, it's also a place that is facing severe land loss. This map here shows the land loss uh, since 1984 and uh, it's projected to continue. So these communities are facing uh, this existential threat. Um, and people have been moving. They've been moving from the Bayou communities uh, further up. And this graphic shows the migration from 2000 to 2010. Uh, those who've remained in these communities tend to be older, lower income, 
Uh, and, you know, these trends um, are expected to continue, you know, when we are able to look at the current census data. I do want to make a point, though, that um, this adaptive migration is hardly new and that the peoples uh, of this land have been moving up really uh, for generations. So to get at our uh, research, we conducted semi-structured interviews with 58 residents of these Bayou communities, people who were currently living uh, within them or people who had relocated, uh, as well as 29 interviews with state and local uh, officials and planners, uh, community leaders who were working um, for organizations uh, that work towards environmental restoration and climate justice, uh, as well as some university researchers and business leaders. Our interviews were conducted face to face. We were uh, able to do these in 2018 through 2020. So before uh, COVID hit, we were fortunate. All of our interviews were recorded. Um, transcribed and the data were analyzed using uh, deduced qualitative uh, software. So today, um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to present a few uh, findings and innovations uh, that resulted from our 29 professional interviews. Um, so our professional interviewees, um, when we talked about the prospect of, of relocation and what could be done to increase the mobility of people who wanted to leave, um, one of the key challenges uh, that came up again and again were conflicting uh, planning and policy goals. Uh, in Louisiana, there's been um, you know, a, a greater realization uh, that people well, one, that they are moving, but that more people are going to have to move. Uh, and that there have been uh, programs proposed uh, to help people who are living outside of uh, the levy system to help buy them out. Um, and, um, you know, as the earlier graphic showed that um, people are uh, relocating uh, on their own. But you know, in the coastal master plan and in um, a variety of adaptation planning processes, although the idea of helping people retreat and helping people uh, relocate if they wanted to is a goal, it's not one of the only goals. Uh, at the same time, the coastal master plan and other planning processes uh, emphasize increased recreational development uh, in these communities. And you can see the uh, two images on the left um, show that there are uh, increased uh, recreational homes, part-time residents for people who wanna come in uh, and enjoy the fishing and, and other amenities that these communities have to offer. Um, so while the development codes are allowing this type of uh, activity to occur, at the same time, um, you know, there has been uh, a retrenchment for services for longtime residents, the closure of schools, um, you know, businesses closing and leaving uh, as the population moves. Um, also, uh, there's been a big emphasis on helping not just people you know, to move out of harm's way, um, but to promote recreational development and uh, preserve this part of Louisiana as a working coast and making sure that we're shoring up the infrastructure uh, for oil and gas and all the other uh, industries that are there. So many of the professionals spoke about really the challenges they faced in working with community residents, longtime residents who feel that they're being told, um, you know, or buyout programs are being proposed uh, at the same time that recreational development is allowed to uh, happen and um, that the working coast is protected. So a, a general feeling um, that they're being pushed out uh, at the same time the area is being uh, developed or redeveloped for these other interests. Um, and, you know, an actual or at least perceived uh, understanding that, you know, there's a shifting of, of resources from uh, one group to another. And so that's a real tension to engage in, you know, fruitful discussions about managed retreat and helping people relocate. 
And while buyouts and relocation um, are looked upon favorably by many state officials, uh, academics, um, you know, really there's a lot of pushback by uh, local officials. Uh, and a real concern about the fiscal impacts of the full-time population uh, moving away, and also the maintenance costs if buyout programs uh, are expanded. And it really points to the need for more state and federal coordination and resources uh, on this local level. I should say that Terrebonne Parish, I mean, it, it's 92% uh, of the land is considered environmentally sensitive. So we talk about relocating, there aren't a lot of places for people to go. And when we talk about the rich indigenous and Cajun cultures, it means people moving oftentimes uh, quite far away from their ancestral uh, homelands. Um, and so more action and resources uh, are needed to, you know, think about how to guide safer residential relocation, um, make this more appealing to local governments in terms of minimizing uh, tax revenue losses and, and supporting uh, infrastructure investment. Um, you know, there's also a concern uh, that the professional interviewees spoke about of, um, you know, different state and local agencies acting at cross purposes. So you can have planners working with communities about thinking about relocation at the same time that you've got other state agencies that are making major uh, investments in amenities for uh, recreational tourists and part-time residents. And it really feeds into this idea that uh, they're being um, pushed out. A couple of other limits uh, to relocation that came up repeatedly uh, is that the current policies and programs and funding mechanisms, I mean, they're often, as we know, tied to uh, disaster recovery and don't facilitate the long-term transformation um, you know, that's needed when we talk about climate adaptation and in terms of how communities and how households uh, make um, decisions. Uh, and then of course, I mean, the barriers that exist uh, for communities on the front line and for low and moderate income households. These are um, households that if they want to uh, relocate often don't have the resources to do so. Uh, and, you know, with the buyout programs as they're currently structured, many of them don't provide the compensation levels and the support necessary to enable people to move to uh, comparable housing uh, in safer locations. And these are all challenges that have come up, um, you know, in a number of the presentations uh, throughout this conference. But I wanted to um, mention what um, we found were some innovations or potential innovations uh, in South uh, Louisiana. And the first here um, is policy flexibility um, responding to community needs. Uh, the state of Louisiana, their Office of Community Development received a $48 million grant from um, HUD to relocate Ile de Jean Charles. Um, from uh, land that was disappearing to um, a settlement about 40 miles north of their original community. There were at least two sessions uh, that addressed this resettlement. Uh, this is a community of uh, people who've been there for generations. Um, as we know with uh, traditional HUD financed relocations that participants are required to transfer, transfer their uh, properties to the state entity. And many island residents were uh, really resistant uh, to do so. They didn't want to lose title to their um, land that had been in their families for generations. And also there was legitimate concerns uh, that the state would redevelop their properties uh, into recreational camps or, or hand it over to oil and gas uh, interests. So to overcome these concerns and help increase participation uh, in the resettlement, the Office of Community Development worked with HUD uh, to allow participants to retain title to their land, including mineral rights. Um, and this way uh, that the residents um, 
their houses would um, be able to stay intact and they would um, hold title to them. They would be restricted from uh, living on that property full time, selling, renting, or uh, redeveloping them, but they would be able to maintain those property claims. Uh, and we need more flexibility um, when working with communities in, in these places to say what do they really need to be able to uh, relocate in a way uh, that's going to uh, put them in a better position and uh, enable them to um, you know, hold on to what is dear to them. A couple of other potential innovations. Well, I think this uh, was definitely a big win um, for the Office of Community Development and the residents of Ville de Jean Charles. Um, we have some other potential, potentially positive uh, developments. You know, we need to have adaptation planning and decision making that occurs at larger geographic scales. Um, and in uh, Louisiana, we launched something called the Louisiana Watershed Initiative. This was launched in 2018 in response to uh, some devastating floods that occurred in 2016. And these were floods that uh, dumped 20 inches or more of rain uh, in parishes throughout the state. Uh, and in response to that, the state was able to um, get a very large flood mitigation grant to say, hey, we need to rethink uh, how we manage uh, flood risk within the state and do so in a way uh, that is uh, regional uh, and will require coordination and cooperation among uh, numerous different government agencies. Uh, so there was certainly um, some hope about uh, this new way of thinking about um, planning around flood risk uh, in Louisiana, but you know, certainly uh, folks are really cautious about um, you know, what uh, this will entail. Um, but the funds will support and have been supporting statewide planning, watershed modeling, data collection, uh, and also the funding of projects that uh, each of the watershed communities uh, select to implement. As part of the Louisiana Watershed Initiative, the state just implemented its first uh, state buyout program. This program has just been unveiled uh, and um, it was designed looking at buyout programs uh, elsewhere in the uni United States, looking at what's worked uh, and what uh, hasn't. Um, it's a voluntary program. Currently, um, it is uh, being rolled out in a neighborhood of a parish far in the west of Louisiana that has flooded repeatedly in recent years and was hard hit by the 2020 hurricanes. The state buyout program uh, is targeting low and moderate income households and as something that was brought up numerous times um, throughout this conference that that raises real equity considerations that low and moderate income communities uh, are often um, asked to move, sorry. Marla, um, we are at time if you are able to wrap up soon, thank you. Um, so looking at this uh, buyout program and, um, you know, potentially being very innovative uh, for the state and the way it's structured is to provide additional compensation and resources for those uh, households that decide to move and some hope that it could uh, reduce inequities among neighborhoods or communities who are contemplating buyouts. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we have Nadia Sidaram, who will be speaking on Resilience for Whom, a Climate Mobility Framework for Equitable Sea Level Rise Adaptation. Okay, uh, thank you everyone uh, for being here. Uh, my name is Nadia Sidaram and I'm a PhD candidate at Florida International University. I'm really excited to show you some of the work that I've been preparing for my uh, dissertation uh, in collaboration with all these wonderful researchers that you see on the screen, um, as well as you know, at all these different uh, institutions. Um, 
Uh, so uh, sea level rise, as we all know, really presents this dynamic, ever-evolving uh, spatiotemporal risk. It, ha it is a challenge of deep uncertainty, and it will affect communities of uh, varying vulnerabilities in different ways over time. And so in South Florida, where I uh, center uh, my study, and it's also where my university is located, um, it's a really interesting place to explore these, um, these issues. Uh, what you see on the right-hand side of your screen are the unified sea level rise projections. And what's really important to note, uh, you know, including all the you know, multiple scientifically justifiable projections for sea level rise, is the ways in which the sea level rise projections are accelerating through time. The compact updates these projections, and you can see that acceleration. And so this uh, sea level rise, you know, manifests in you know these two types of effects. Um, one, I'm, I would sort of call more direct effects, these impacts of flooding hazards, whether they be tidal, coastal, pluvial, compound, or flood uh, related as well. But then there's more of these indirect effects where people on these sort of high risk uh, areas, as many uh, presenters have already sort of mentioned today um, and throughout this conference, that people are now sort of realizing this isn't the best um, investment anymore. Uh, developers, people, governments are sort of shifting the flow of capital and people to sort of safer areas for long-term resilience. And so both sets of effects will really contribute to migration and displacement in coastal communities over time. And so this is where uh, the, where I started to think through this sort of framework for thinking about climate mobilities and the way that it emerged. You know, with varying levels of exposure to sea level rise throughout time and varying vulnerabilities in coastal communities, how can we think about these impacts of sea level rise over time? And what does it mean for mobility for different communities? Um, so when you intersect these um, uh, these two axes, what really sort of is is is, 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 is there are these four distinct community types. Um, and of course, there are multiple ways in which people will be mobile. Um, but these uh, four community types also reflect these his, uh, historic trends, um, present trends in disaster relief, uh, ways in which communities are uh, responding in terms of their adaptive capacity. And so the first one uh, is, you know, there are group communities that will likely just be stable. They are uh, low exposure to sea level rise, low vulnerability, have a higher adaptive capacity, um, and so their potential for mobility is just quite low. And then on the other side of that, you have a lot of people who have a higher exposure to sea level rise with lower vulnerability. This is actually a lot of the Miami-Dade coastline. Uh, in general, on an individual level, people have the uh, people in this category have the uh, ability to adapt. They're also more likely to receive uh, government support. So they just generally have greater flexibility and capacity for mobility. Um, on the other side of the vulnerability spectrum, we have residents who are living in areas of low exposure, but are more in this sort of vulnerable uh, category. And as these resilience investments flow to these areas, if there is nothing in place to sort of counter that, we could sort of see the potential for displacement and that really tries to capture that climate gentrification phenomena. And finally, we have the trapped um, uh, typology where you know, people have high exposure, high vulnerability, lower ad adaptive capacity in general, fewer disaster relief and public benefits moving towards these areas, and policies that don't favor and policies that favor economically robust protection are also not likely to sort of favor these areas. And so when I think about this mobility framework as a whole, and I wanted to sort of apply it to Miami-Dade County, the first few questions that I uh, started to process were, you know, how do I want to assess social and economic vulnerability? Thankfully, there are so many existing measures of vulnerability that are already uh, in use that I had a really rich place to, to start from. But one thing that I really noticed about these existing measures, they kind of uh, think about, think through vulnerability on the scale of like zero to one. You have the census track or whatever census unit you're using and a score is given from zero to one. And so my research is kind of shifting away from this a bit. And instead we are looking at relative vulnerability and I'll explain what that is in a second. And then the second question is, how do I want to measure exposure risk? Also lots of flood uh, related flood risk products are available. And I'll be talking about uh, the digital elevation model and the primo model as well. But shifting back to this assessment of vulnerability. So relative vulnerability uses the exact same indicators that would be in these sort of absolute vulnerability metrics. Um, but the difference is instead of aggregating them and weighing them, 
we are trying to understand how these indicators, these you know characteristics, these processes kind of converge geospatially to you know uh, to make certain sets of communities higher on the vulnerability scale or lower on the vulnerability scale, and it allows us to have a more nuanced picture of social vulnerability. In order to do this, we had to use model-based clustering, so we used an EM algorithm with the MCLUST package in R, and the indicators were constructed use, uh, using uh, American Community Survey ACS data from the census and as well as data uh, from HUD as well. So hopefully this uh, makes it a bit more clear what the social vulnerability profiles are. So on the left-hand side of your screen, you see Miami-Dade County and all its different census tracts. So this analysis was done at the track level. And on the uh, right-hand side, you'll see uh, the box plots that show the distribution of these different indicators that we selected for this analysis. Um, so we have uh, the percentage of elderly populations. We have here the percentage of the black population, um, really because Miami-Dade County is a city, of, or Miami -Dade, the city of Miami was founded during the Jim Crow era and the legacy of historic segregation, discri uh, discriminatory housing policy is still very much alive and present in, uh, in the county today. We have uh, foreign born uh, individuals, not necessarily an indicator of vulnerability in Miami, but when coupled with limited English speaking skills, that does tell us something about uh, who's living uh, where. Uh, education, access to uh, vehicles, uh, poverty level, whether or not you're a renter, whether or not you're a renter that's cost burden, um, uh, receiving public benefits, unemployment, and uh, whether or not you have health insurance, all of these indicators are being measured on this y axis here. So you're seeing the percent uh, distribution of these indicators within each of these profiles that have been determined to be the lower vulnerability profiles. Um, and on the second y-axis, all we have here is median household income. So the lightest green region here, um, or these sets of tracks, represent the lowest of the lower vulnerability profile. They map onto what we know are very wealthy regions of, uh, of Miami. Um, we move into the moderate vulnerability profiles. These are again representing more working class, uh, working class, middle class uh, areas. These uh, tracks contain the majority of Miami-Dade County's uh, population. You can see that there are a bit more foreign born people, a bit more renters here, lower rates of unemployment. And as for, as for median household income, uh, most of the people living in these uh, tracks are hovering somewhere around the county median of around $52,000 um, per year. Um, and then when we move in finally to the higher vulnerability profiles, what you'll see is the way that these, again, these, uh, these plot plots are sort of moving. Um, profiles six and seven have the highest distribution of the black population. And as I mentioned, you know, the historic segregation, that legacy is very much alive and present in Miami-Dade. And, and this, uh, this assessment really um, shows that as well. Uh, profile eight, the sort of darker purple here, has a very high percentage of foreign born populations, again, coupled with limited English speaking sp uh, skills. So, really showing us where um, you know, communities of, of, of heavily populated by um, Spanish speaking immigrants may be uh, located in, uh, in Miami. Um, and so the way, the reason that we sort of chose this approach is so that one, we could sort of take a look at vulnerability across. Um, across this geography and not only see differences within you know, groups that we may sort of consider to be of the same vulnerability, but see those, those differences across varying vulnerabilities as well. So with that rich in sort of nuanced approach to social vulnerability, our next step was to try to connect this with some of the flood risk uh, models. Um, and so through a collaboration with researchers at UC Irvine who have developed the parallel raster inundation model. It is a high resolution localized uh, flood risk model that is able to show multiple flood risk drivers as well. Um, I will never be able to do their model justice. So I uh, highly, um, I, I encourage you to reach out to Brett Sanders and Joe Schubert if you want to know more about the model. I'll be presenting some of the data layers today that show some of this uh, composite uh, inundation. So one, two, three meters of sea level rise that includes uh, groundwater interaction as well. And the reason that it's really interesting to sort of use Primo is because it gives us a little bit more information that we would get that we, than we would get from say a bathtub model approach uh, using a digital elevation model that isn't hydro conditioned or uh, really is just looking at explicitly at elevation. And what I mean here is, you know, taking a look at uh, this graph that shows buildings inundated 
under varying scenarios, um, you know, one meter to sea level rise, two meter and three, and then comparing how many buildings are inundated under these different scenarios. There's not so much difference between uh, Primo and the digital elevation model between one meter and three meter, but the two meter scenario, we can see that, you know, the Primo is predicting about me or, or showing at least more than 100% increase in uh, buildings that are inundated here. So we're getting a lot more uh, information. Um, and so now combining this with the social vulnerability profile information and just taking a look at the PRIMO models um, for ground for, again, just inundation, um, sea level rise scenarios, plus uh, interacting groundwater, um, I'm able to sort of differentiate what properties would fall into these sort of stable migrating displaced and trapped um, um, properties here. And so I've used uh, properties um, uh, here to get us closer to this sort of uh, population estimates. So that's the next step of this research. Um, and what you're really seeing here under a one meter uh, sea level rise inundation scenario is for the most part, there are a lot of properties that are still um, above water and not inundated. I want you to pay really close attention to this area here because when I take those other layers away, you can see here, these are the most at risk uh, uh, properties uh, for being inundated under a meter of, of sea level rise. The blue represents these sort of trapped populations. And I know the yellow is a little bit difficult to see, but I promise it's there around Miami Beach and some of these Western areas uh, in Miami. Miami as well, also along uh, some of the Miami River uh, here. But by the time we get to a three meter uh, scenario of sea level rise, we see those colors really flip. Um, and I think what is really interesting about, you know, taking away, you know, what we know to be inundation, what you can see here are the most stable properties or, or, or areas in Miami and the areas most likely where uh, residents currently living are likely to be displaced over time because they are still above water uh, in this sort of three meter scenario. And so the next steps for this research are one, you know, converting these buildings, these properties into population estimates. It's great to have that knowledge, but it'd be really wonderful to kind of put a population estimate to who's living in those buildings. Uh, the other is ground truthing, really trying to figure out, you know, whether or not this framework maps onto real life at all. As some of the presenters uh, mentioned here, people are mobile for many reasons, not just sea level rise. And so trying to figure out how people are actually feeling about that. I conducted 40 interviews um, already uh, to that uh, to that end, and those will, and so that analysis is underway, and that will lead to a larger countywide survey. And then lastly, and not in sequential order at all, but continuous engagement with some of our uh, community partners and stakeholders um, on this uh, research. And um, you know, to close out, I'd like to say what is presented is not deterministic. My hope for this framework is that we can choose a more equitable future when we sort of have this information uh, presented to us. And that is all, thank you. Thank you so much, Nadia. Next, we have Simon Richter, who will be presenting the Dutch Plan B, keeping retreat on the table in the safest Delta in the world. Hi, um, I'm Simon Richter, University of Pennsylvania. Um, I focus on the cultural aspects of climate adaptation uh, in the Netherlands, Germany, Indonesia, and the US. Um, let me begin. It won't surprise anyone if I say that the Dutch don't like talking about retreat. The Dutch believe they live in the safest delta in the world. Projections of sea level rise don't phase them. The Delta works and their iconic storm surge barriers protect 26% of the country at or below sea level. The majority of the population, millions of people, and the preponderance of their assets are already below sea level. There's been no flood related loss of life since 1953. Everything is under control. That being the case, how do you tell the Dutch that it makes sense to plan for retreat? Let's complicate things even more. There are seven taboos that protect the Dutch psyche from the specter of inundation. Don't question our peerless water management prowess at home or abroad. Don't cause panic. Don't carry on about the severity of climate change. Don't endanger our Moody's AAA rating. Don't notice our poor greenhouse gas mitigation record. Don't get in the way of spatial planning. This one is under pressure. 
as is the last, don't mention retreat. First, some context. In 2008, the second Delta Commission was tasked with preparing the nation for the effects of climate change. Taking the 2007 IPCC report as reference, the commission recommended that the country prepare for sea level rise of between 65 centimeters and 1.3 meters by 2100 and two to four meters by 2200. Retreat was not on the table. Our delta, the coast and its hinterland, is home to a vast wealth of economic, ecological, and social values. It's inconceivable that the Netherlands would want to sacrifice this wealth. By and large, the guidelines and the sentiment of the Second Delta Commission still guide Dutch water defense policy. The precautionary numbers the Delta Commission proposed depend on not including the uncertain contributions of Antarctica. The 2014 Delta scenarios used for planning at the national level trim the numbers even further. Worst case scenarios assume a maximum of 40 centimeters in 2050 and a maximum of one meter in 2100. But things started to shift in 2017 when the renowned Water Research Institute Deltaris quietly published the results of a policy hackathon under the title, What if sea level rises more rapidly? Concerned that the Netherlands was seriously underestimating the risk, a multidisciplinary crew of almost 30 experts calculated the limits of the water defense systems and proposed adaptations for scenarios ranging up to 20 meters. The analytic part of the hackathon was elaborated and reissued more officially in September 2018, you see it on the right, under the title, Possible Consequences of Accelerated Sea Level Rise for the Delta Program. The new report claimed that the Delta works would be adequate until 2050 and that it was necessary to begin planning for higher, higher sea levels immediately. An infographic showed the limits, costs, and interestingly, the nagging virtual proximity of Antarctica. Up until this point, the discussion about accelerated sea level rise flew under the public radar. That changed in early 2019, when a national weekly published a splashy article with the title, Sea Level Rise is a Bigger Problem Than We Think, and the Netherlands Doesn't Have a Plan B. Shortly thereafter, a landscape architect, Eric Young Pleister of Lola Landscape, countered on social media with what he called Plan B. It showed an inundated Netherlands with the dunes as barrier islands and a new coastline in the east forming a lagoon with raised and floating cities as well as floating agriculture. Pleister addressed retreat head on. The inhabitants of the lower parts of the country will have to move themselves and all facilities, infrastructures and employment opportunities to the east. Along this eastern coast, the economic heart of the country will be reconstructed. But statements such as these still fall on deaf ears. The same cannot be said of Deltaris's next move. It released a publication called Strategies for Adapting to Higher and Faster Sea Level Rise, which spelled out adaptation pathways the hackathon had hinted at. Crucial for public debate, uh, were four images that represent distinct ways to approach sea level rise. The drawings are in a cartoon style designed to disarm the viewer. Protect closed shows the Netherlands as a fortress and foregrounds massive pumps required to drain polders and rivers. Protect open emphasizes the spatial consequences of keeping rivers open to the sea. The bustling image of advance involves offshore land reclamation, a new airport, and the creation of a freshwater lake along the length of the coast. All three of these mean doubling down on armoring the coast, regardless of the costs in terms of carbon footprint and environmental impact. Only the fourth, moving with the flow, technically accommodate, makes room for the sea and implies retreat. The fourth is also the only image that gestures subtly towards the borders with Belgium and Germany, Deutschland. 
that would come into play because of migration. Del Tyrus's efforts paid off. In 2019, the Ministry of Infrastructure and Water and the Delta Commissioner established the Sea Level Rise Knowledge Program. Their remit extends to exploring adaptation pathways and timelines for the future, but emphasizes the elimination of sea level rise uncertainty and the viability of existing measures first. The four pathways in their pictures were widely distributed. Mario Lane Haas note, Del Tyres's climate adaptation expert, appeared on television, radio, online, and at town halls. What became increasingly apparent was that the long-term choice had resolved into two diametrically opposed strategies. The first, uh, the two versions of protect were simply not enough. The only serious alternatives were advance, which resonates well, or accommodate plus retreat, which resonates poorly. Although the Dutch won't decide to construct a coastal seawall anytime soon, every decision to build new housing, infrastructure, and other buildings at levels lower than two meters above sea level is a wager that they will eventually fit, that they eventually will. This matters. The Dutch want to build a million housing units in the next 10 years. The Delta Commissioner and the Union of District Water Authorities publicly and urgently advise caution. Should the Dutch persist in building below sea level, they, it will be because they are proceeding with what I call a too deep to fail policy. So how do we motivate actions that lay the groundwork for a massive measured relocation to the east? I suggest that we start by adding four pictures that represent possible outcomes based on the choices the Netherlands makes. Let's call them one, the big gamble. Dutch priorities remain the same. Dyke reinforcement continues as does investment in the lower Netherlands. Perhaps the Paris Climate Agreement is a success. Perhaps sea level rise is limited to one meter by 2100. It's a big gamble, but who knows? Maybe the Dutch will be lucky. Two hostile takeover. Sea level rise accelerates, a mass of storm strikes and the Dutch water system fails. The lower Netherlands are flooded. The economy is devastated. Millions seek shelter in the east. The Dutch are dependent on international aid. Three, capital flight. Moody's decreases the Dutch credit rating. Investors flee to higher ground. Wealthy inhabitants follow while low income residents remain trapped. Four, a second piece of Münster, abandoning the war against water and tapping into the historical negotiations that enabled Dutch independence and a framework for peace in Europe after the Thirty Years' War, the nation embarks on a visionary transboundary project with Germany and Belgium. I'm excited by the prospect of using an ethnographically informed participatory design process to imagine in compelling detail a Dutch-German transboundary region that entices and absorbs massive population shifts from coastal regions of the Lower Netherlands, Belgium, and Germany against the temporal backdrop of accelerated sea level rise. It will involve a transboundary region that purposefully synergizes the economic potential on both sides of the border. The transportation system and renewable energy infrastructure that will make this possible, an integrated environmental land use plan that makes decisions about afforestation, agriculture, and biodiversity according to ecological criteria, a beautiful variety of transboundary social housing developments based on sharing economies, equity, energy autonomy, and community agriculture, the pioneering legal frameworks that will be needed, the intentional cultivation of the kind of welcoming culture that will be the hallmark of thriving communities in the Anthropocene, and the kinds of education and community agency that can make it happen. There are indications that the viability of retreat is making further inroads. Del Tares subtly revealed the existence of a banner for retreat called for Platzen among the adaptation pathways. Notice the format consistency. In a recent editorial, Mayolaine Hasnot reshuffled the Del Tares deck 
collapsing the two forms of protect into one and explicitly introducing the term retreat. In an interview in a prominent national newspaper, she said, we don't know when, but the retreat will become an attractive option. It's still on the table, even in the Netherlands. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will wrap up this panel with our final speaker, Jamin Vandenhoek, who will be speaking on charting justice for refugee relocation under extreme climate change. Thank you so much. My co-author, Laura Peters, is also here. And let me share my screen. All right, thanks so much for the introduction. Really have enjoyed the presentations today. My virtual background is getting crazy. Um, we're gonna bear through, go through with it. Um, thanks for the introduction. My name is Jamin Vandenhoek. Uh, I'm an associate professor at Oregon State. Uh, this is Laura Peters, a postdoctoral research fellow at uh, University College London. We're gonna be talking today about uh, turning justice for refugee re relocation under extreme climate change. And just as a note, this is part of a based on a forthcoming chapter in the book, Global Views on Climate Relocation and Social Justice, edited by uh, Jola and Siders, who are both taking part in the same conference. So um, there are 26 million refugees across 132 of the world's 195 countries. This is a global phenomenon. Um, this is a long-term phenomenon as well. This is, we've had refugees uh, formally uh, for uh, almost 70 years, over 70 years now. Um, refugees are international migrants who have been forcibly displaced from their home countries due to violence or persecution uh, for a variety of reasons and have been granted formal protections under international law. Um, and the vast majority of refugees seek asylum in neighboring countries. So this is a regional and global problem, but it's also in a sense a very local problem. Um, one thing that's not very uh, well appreciated is that refugee camps today will likely still be occupied, which is to say inhabited for decades to come due to so-called warehousing policies. Now these are nation level policies uh, instituted by refugee hosting uh, country governments. Uh, the goal of these is effectively to securitize refugees. It isolates refugees geographically, marginalizes refugees economically and broadly denies them rights to migration and employment. Um, it's also an excellent predictor of protraction, that is to say the duration of refugee settlement in camps, uh, as well as dependence on host governments. It increases protraction and it increases dependence. And this is far from being a, a, a small problem. More than 75% of refugees as of 2019 were living in a protracted refugee scenario, uh, which is where 25,000 refugees from the same country live in a camp more than five years. So this is a, a large scale phenomenon that is not nearly appreciated um, in terms of detrimental effects on refugee lives and livelihoods. Separate but compounding these challenges to warehousing is uh, climate exposure. Refugee camps are increasingly exposed to climate hazards such as landslides, flooding, droughts, and heat waves. Many of you may know about flooding in Cox's Bazaar um, that uh, attained international attention in 2017. This is a recurrent challenge um, and this are, these challenges are made all the more difficult because of these restrictive migration and communication policies um, imposed upon refugees. Re warehousing policies, um, even in those kinds of climate uh, extreme events, extreme climate events, warehousing policies restrict refugees from leaving the camp. Um, we know that migration, voluntary migration, is a strategic decision to mitigate climate effects. We've seen um, five presentations preceding ours that, that show the value of voluntary migration or the potential value to mitigate climate effects. Um, refugees don't have that luxury. They don't have that right. Compounding all this again is that we know extreme temperatures are all but guaranteed with projected climate change at current refugee hosting regions across Sub-Saharan Africa in particular. Um, this is an important deviation from our research. We are not talking about future climate refugees where people will be leaving. We're talking about current refugees who in all likelihood are going to be still living in camps a decade from now. And given that over a million children were born refugees over the last three years, those children are going to stay refugees through 2040 when this projected period that we're seeing here represented begins. That means 
climate change is expected to broadly make refugee hosting regions unsuitable for lives and livelihoods, not just by the refugees, not just for refugees, but also for refugee hosting countries and communities that the refugees interact with socioeconomically when possible. This work is from uh, Shu et al, published last year, focuses on the climate niche and the, the uh, abandonment, of the, the, the uh, disappearance of the climate niche across the world. Their uh, model uh, suggests that uh, under the RCP 8.5, so-called business as usual scenario, three and a half billion people, roughly 30% of the projected 2070 global population will have to migrate in order uh, to, to move into a uh, supported climate niche that we've seen that we've all uh, depended on uh, for the past several millennia, refugees are included in that population. So we have this challenge, right? We have the compounding effects of, of restrictive warehouse policies that confine refugees to camps for years and extreme temperatures. Together, those may result in refugee camps acting as climate traps. So how do we address these intersections between current refugees, migration, and climate change? Can we look to existing policies like uh, and frameworks like the Global Compact on Refugees, uh, which was published in 2018, uh, the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration, published in the same year, or um, something as sort of long-standing and respected as UNFCCC, published originally in 1992? None of those grapple with these effects. You look for terms like climate change, you'll come up empty-handed. And so while refugee camps are not permanent solutions, the purpose of refugee camps is to offer security and a basic standard quality of life prior to finding an alternative durable solution, such as voluntary repatriation, integration um, into the host country, or resettlement in a third country. And where refugee camps no longer safeguard the human rights of refugees, they are simply no longer habitable where short and long-term durability cannot be achieved in the original refugee camp sites, planned climate relocation may be a necessary solution to avert a cascading humanitarian crisis where refugees are initially forcibly displaced from violence only to be forcibly displaced again or trapped by the extreme effects of climate change in places of supposed refuge. And because the planned relocation of refugee camps is likely to be costly in terms of finances, politics, and social aspects, in most cases, it should be pursued only after other options have been exhausted, such as pursuing preferred durable solutions or choosing to make refugee camps more durable through policy changes, like allowing refugees more permanent structures and more freedom of movement and communication and so on. So refugee camps, as any human settlement, are more than physical infrastructure, but represent spaces of relative stability, habitation, and hope. Their long-term durability matters to achieving security from socially induced violence, as well as climate-related risks. Planned climate relocation in non-refugee camp settings is typically driven by and negotiated between local communities and national authorities in terms of collectively deciding to relocate, marshalling the resources and political will to enable a move, and building a resilient community, not only in terms of physical infrastructure, but also linking new locations with cultural, livelihood, and basic service needs. And refugees are very vulnerable, but they are also resilient and must be included as a vital part of the solutions that affect them, including those related to planned climate relocation. Even when it has been decided that planned relocation is necessary, the already very complex process of planned climate relocation becomes all the more challenging in refugee camps due to the demographic, social, institutional, and political barriers at play which we have represented in this slide, and the diverse stakeholders, including but not limited to refugees, hosts in other local communities, national authorities, and the international community involved in decision making. There are also advantages when compared with typical non-refugee communities, um, and we have a few identified here, such as those related to attachment to place, 
resources that they may be able to marshal and rights that they are given um, by way of the 1951 Refugee Convention. At a basic level, relocation strategies would benefit from social justice principles, which guide the fair and compassionate distribution of power and resources, starting with the right of all human beings to benefit from a safe and pleasant environment, according to the UN. The concept of social justice we should mention has been well discussed by social scientists, theorists, and philosophers, but it is a far from unified field owing to the diversity of perspectives on what constitutes a just world. Justice is not just about who causes climate change and who is most affected by the impacts of climate change, but social justice should also guide how we manage and mitigate these impacts moving forward. For example, distributive justice raises questions about the fair distribution of benefits and costs. Procedural justice is concerned with ensuring a fair process to guarantee fair outcomes. And restorative justice seeks to restore relationships and avoid stigmatization while fighting against injustice. An approach to the planned climate relocation of refugee camps that, re that leverages distributed, procedural, and restorative justice seeks solutions that are durable from the perspective of refugees, host communities, and national and international policy communities alike. And so we, we finish our, we conclude by offering the following four recommendations in pursuit of socially just climate relocation of refugee camps which are number one, restrictions on voluntary migration of refugees from camps should be recognized as being detrimental to climate change mitigation and adaptation. And refugees should be granted explicit international assistance and protections from the effects of climate change. Two, the UNHCR should begin planning for climate relocation in refugee hosting regions that are expected to become unlivable due to climate change. Three, the process of climate relocation for refugee camps from conceptualization to implementation should take on a social justice orientation in order to safeguard and restore the human rights and dignity of refugees. And finally, four, further research should be undertaken on the planned climate relocation of refugee camps including the extent to which this adaptation strategy can mutually benefit refugees and host communities. We thank you so much for your attention and we look forward to any discussion that we may have time for. Thank you both so much. Um, we have about two minutes left in the session. So unfortunately, I don't think we have time to field uh, questions right now, but please keep in mind that if you go to the attendees tab of the conference, you can see everybody who has presented, everybody who's attending, and you can set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting to follow up with any of your fellow panelists or any attendees that have questions. So uh, thank you so much to this fantastic panel. Please enjoy the remainder of the conference. Thanks so much.